Now we come to the first application, which is space mission planning. So, save Mark Watney. Many of you, I assume, have read the, uh, the book, The Martian, and um, maybe even seen the movie. And uh, there an astronaut has stranded on Mars and we have to bring him back to Earth. So he, he's able to get into, into orbit of Mars, but not much further than that. So we need to send a rocket to pick him up from Mars and bring him back to Earth. And uh, for this we have to do a flyby of Mars and um, have to be well, hit uh, Mars uh, or get as close as possible to Mars uh, with, without hitting Mars. Okay, um, the rocket. For this example we are simplifying things a little bit and now we assume that the rocket has to be cheap and we cannot carry fuel um, um, outside of Earth's orbit. So we have, to, we have to pick up speed and then we leave Earth and afterwards we have a ballistic trajectory so afterwards the, the, the rocket is moving like more like a cannonball uh, so it is, it is attracted by the gravity of the different planets um, and uh, just by giving it an initial speed and direction uh, we need to bring it on a ballistic course that uh, sends the rocket to Mars and afterwards back to Earth where Mars and Earth are obviously moving at the same time. So all the planets are moving at the same time and everybody is pulling with its gravity and Sun also pulls with gravity and uh, the question is which way to, to shoot the rocket so that it, uh, it picks up Mark Watney and, and brings him back to Earth. And uh, your mission, should you accept it, is to design this course or to, to find exactly the trajectory that, that, uh, that will save him. There's a, um, a movie about the people who did the actual trajectory computation at NASA back in the 60s and uh, what's interesting here these were black ladies and um, some of them were even still alive when the movie came out a couple of years ago and uh, this was a big recognition of their work and they used the very early IBM uh, computers to numerically perform this calculation and uh, many of the techniques that we are using here uh, were also in use uh, back then uh, but obviously since then the state of the art has greatly improved and now we not only have uh, ballistic trajectories but the rockets can also steer and um, we, we are doing slingshots uh, over across multiple planets and stuff like that. Um, so it's a little bit simplified here but still the techniques are realistic and if you watch that movie uh, you see some hints and some, some techniques are also mentioned and you will see that um, uh, well, it, we have reached at least the state of the art of the 60s uh, to do this example. And, uh, but it took many, many years to get there. So the, the theory that we need to consider, it goes back hundreds of years uh, because we have to describe the movement of the planets first in order to then optimize our trajectory. And this is a little bit problematic because we cannot describe the movement of the planets in a closed form equation. We can only numerically approximate that. Uh, so this is known as the n-body problem, where I have n and n greater than 2 massive objects that interact with each other by gravitation and um, we then want to describe their movement and actually it was proven many years ago and, uh, by Poincaré that um, um, there can be no closed form solution and with that he got the prize money that was awarded for the closed form solution but he could show that such a solution could not exist. And um, going back we then also encounter a lot of the great men of uh, science, back then mostly men, um, for example um, leading up to, to Newton who, who came up with the final theory of gravitation. Leading up to Newton we had Copernicus who first had to declare, declare that Earth is not in the center of the universe. 
Then we had Kepler, who uh, told that planets have elliptic orbits around the Sun. Uh, in between, uh, we also had um, uh, Descartes, which, uh, who said that um, only bodies that are touching can interact with each other, because what he observed on Earth is that only objects that are in direct contact, or maybe with a gas in between, can, can interact, and therefore he declared there has to be some substance between the planets, so they could interact with each other by gravity, and he called that ether. Today we know that that's not the case. Um, but those were all the different theories that were discussed back then. There were also theories by Tycho Brahe, on, uh, who wanted to, um, who claimed that some of the planets move around Earth, and some of the planets move around Sun, and so on. So there was a big confusion. Also Gal Galileo came in, and um, uh, brought in the idea that all bodies are um, accelerated by gravitation. And finally Newton, who settled the case by also inventing calculus, so basically what is a derivative and what's, uh, what is integration, um, in his uh, major work, uh, the Principia Mathematica. And uh, so what we see now is um, the the Newton's theory of gravitation. So how do we solve the n-body problem in a numerical fashion? First of all, we say that we have um, our set of, of planets or of bodies, the planets and the sun, and also our rocket that we are interested in. And each of these bodies is described by its mass. So here we have a mass, uh, we have a position, so this is a vector, and we have a speed. So here the speed is the derivative of the position. So in physics, the little dot, it indicates a derivative with respect to time, and we're using it, it, it for, the, for the p dot. Okay, um, and in addition to speed, we also need to consider acceleration. And acceleration is what we get from gravity. So here, um, all the planets are pulling. Um, and uh, how strongly they pull, it depends on the distance between the planets. So here the distance is here just the Euclidean, the two norm. We don't consider uh, relativity theory here. So here the distance is the two norm. And, uh, and then with this equation here, that also includes the gravitational constant. Um, we can compute the force exerted from one planet on, on another. And uh, together with the mass of the planet, we then know the acceleration that it receives. Okay, um, if you want to go deeper, there is a book called Structure and Interpretation of Classical Mechanics. And this is from the same people who also wrote the book Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, the book that we saw earlier in this lecture. Um, it's in the same style. So it also contains the, 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 the code together with a mathematical explanation on the same page. Uh, it's a very interesting book, but it goes much deeper than we can go here. Um, so if you want to go really deep on the subject, go read Structure and Interpretation of Classical Mechanics, but it might take you a while. Um, okay, so here we have now the acceleration and um, another simplification that we are doing in this lecture is we are only considering uh, a two-dimensional approximation. We don't have to do that. Uh, so the equations, if I have a 3D vector or only a 2D vector uh, here for the position, the speed and the acceleration, the equation works out exactly the same, the same also the code. Um, um, but this is just a simplification that we have for, for easier plotting and, and evaluation and things like that. Okay, so now for the numerical simulation of the movement of the planets, uh, we again discretize the time domain, similar to what we did uh, with model predictive control in the previous lecture. And similarly, we also use the Verlet method to simulate forward between our discrete time steps. And now we have um, for all the planets, or we only consider a subset of the planets, we have their weight, we know their distance to the sun, we know their speed, we have an initial position, and off we go. We can simulate numerically 
um, the, the movement of the planets in our solar system. And um, in Julia, it looks the following. So here we define a structure for our moving bodies where we have a position, we have uh, the speed and we have the mass. Um, what is important here, here this is um, like um, a template. So here we have a free um, type T and here we can plug in the dual numbers later on. So usually here this would be a float 64 or some other um, well, representation of a real number. But later on here we have the freedom to plug in also our dual numbers uh, and therefore here we have the T. Um, then we also define the two norm. Um, we have a list of the bodies with their initial or with their mass and initial position and speed and so on. And uh, with this we can now define the function that simulates the, the movement of the planets. So first of all we iterate over all the planets and compute their acceleration. And uh, we fill a big matrix uh, with the acceleration vector for all the different planets and the sun. And afterwards we update the position and the speed of every planet with the Verlet algorithm. And in the uh, exercise you will do the same and then we also see nice plots of, of planets moving around and gravity interacting and stuff like that. Okay, but we not only want to simulate the movement of the planets, we also want to shoot out the rocket in the correct direction. And uh, for that, we need a loss function. So we need a, um, a, an evaluation that tells us whether this was a good direction or not. So let's recall that we want, first of all, our rocket to do a flyby uh, on Mars and then to come back to Earth. And uh, for that, first of all, we extend our simulation by just adding our rocket uh, to the list of, of bodies that we are considering. And here for the list of bodies that we are considering, um, we, we take the, the rocket at Earth's position with a little offset um, and with the initial speed of the Earth and an offset of the speed theta. So this theta is what we are selecting and this is the, the, the speed that we give the rocket as it leaves Earth. Okay, and then we can um, simulate everything forward. So we are in a big, uh, in a big uh, loop for all the different time steps that we are considering. And, um, uh, and we write out the distance of our rocket to Mars and we write out our distance to Earth in every iteration of the simulation loop. Okay, and now um, once we have done that here we, we have uh, two big vectors um, or two big arrays with the distance to Mars and the distance to Earth in every time step and now we can find the time step when we are closest to Mars and afterwards we consider all the time steps when we have already been to Mars um, and come back to Earth and then we consider how close we have come to Earth after Mars. And the loss function that we are minimizing is first of all the minimum distance that we ever had to Mars and second the minimum distance we uh, have to Earth after having been to Mars. It's a bit backwards but I hope you see how this is a target function that um, is useful to us because this target function is uh, zero only when we get exactly to Mars and then back exactly to Earth. Okay, um, now uh, we have a target function that takes as input a vector and gives us back like a quality of the vector or how much um, the well, how much how much the anticipated loss is for that vector in terms of the distances. And using automatic differentiation, we can now just write gradient of trajectory loss, comma, theta for some theta that we have that we have chosen, and we get back the gradient of our simulation 
with respect to the theta vector. So in which direction do we have to move our theta vector to get an improvement? And if you plug in the examples from the previous slides, it works out of the box. You don't itself contain, you, need, you don't need anything in addition. We can already compute um, the gradient here now for the loss function for our uh, mission planning of the rocket. And um, the, the slide or the, the, the figure that you see here, this is the loss function evaluated for different theta. So we have a, a 2D vector for, for, for the theta because we're in a 2D uh, world that we have assumed. Um, and uh, so this is a little bit easier for plotting now. Uh, and now we can plot the loss function for different values of theta. And uh, we see that this is a very much a non-convex function. So the simulation that we did and the loss function on top of it results in a very non-convex function. And we even have here some, some funny peaks. And the funny peak here, it happens when we slingshot around one of the planets and then it really kicks us out and we, um, we um, end up far away from, from the solar system. Uh, so there are some very sharp peaks also in, in our uh, loss function. And uh, what we can do for the optimization then is first of all to, to, to go over this um, loss function here or over the, the space for our uh, possible thetas in a regular grid and make the grid finer and finer and finer and finer. Uh, but obviously this can become very expensive, especially when we are in, in higher dimensional spaces. So what we do instead is, yes, we do some we, we, we are on the grid and we are evaluating some example points, but then we use the gradient that we have available to us to do a gradient descent. And then um, very quickly we will improve our solutions and then we are somewhat more robust to the, to the grid size that we have chosen uh, because, well, depending on the curvature of the, of the loss function, um, uh, we will then, by do, using gradient descent, move towards a better solution that is in the, um, in the vicinity or in the neighborhood of, of the point on the grid that we have started with. And you will do this in the exercise and then in the exercise you will also have the dynamic plots where you can uh, see the rocket flying and, and the planets moving and things like that.